I am here with Joe Club. Joe, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Paul. Excellent. Well, um, great that we are finally uh, meeting in person. We've, you know, I've followed your work for quite a while, and I think you've you've followed uh, Martin and I's work. You've written an excellent blog post for us on a Hit Science website for some time. Um, maybe Joe, just to get us started, uh, tell us a little bit about your your background. And we always like to ask. Uh, you know, where people got interested in sport um, initially. So, uh, yeah, maybe maybe talk us through that. Um, well, I was brought up in a sport-loving household um, and, yeah, grew up going to football, watching football, playing football um, and trying every sport possible. Um, and then specifically in relation to sports science, I I can pinpoint the moment when I actually – knew that's what I wanted to do because I saw a TV program about sports science when I was about 12 years old on TV. And I still, I think I probably have a VHS tape of, of the episode somewhere, probably in my parents' loft. Uh, and I knew that was what I wanted to do. And they showed Loughborough University and, and that's where I wanted to go. So yeah, fast forward a few years now. Um, I've worked as an applied sports scientist across a number of team sports. So initially getting into football, I worked with the Chelsea um, men's side, um, both across first team and academy over sort of five, six years there. And then a year at Brighton Hove Albion, actually, when they were in the championship and obviously now well established in the Premier League as of right now, um, before then getting an opportunity to go out to the US and work in um, ice hockey in the NHL with the Buffalo Sabres a um, few years there and then. Um, the ownership owned both the Sabres and the Bills, which is the NFL team. So I then started doing some work with them and that snowballed into a year working for both teams and then going full time at the Bills for a few years. And then, yeah, a couple of years ago, decided to move back to the UK and start a new challenge and chapter. And um, for me, I, I really enjoy applied sports science and I, I appreciate the opportunities I've had to work in different sports and different settings. And I just wanted to keep doing that. And so now um, set up my company, Global Performance Insights, and work as a consultant across different teams, different sports and different countries, um, as well as advising some sports tech companies, doing some lecturing and all a whole variety of jobs and projects, which is a fantastic opportunity. That's so cool. Um, again, I'm a big fan of yours and I follow a lot of your work and one of the really cool um, things you've written on is Simon Sinek's, um, you know, start with a why. And I share for that, I share that uh, as well. So for me, for me, my why also kind of came on, on television. I was watching um, a big race in the Hawaiian Ironman, Dave Scott, Mark Allen battling it out. And for whatever reason, it was, it was wild because they, they battled right to the bitter end, right? With one, uh, one or two miles to go, basically, neck and neck, pushing each other. And they did something like they set records that, that took 20 years to break thereafter. But it was and it was so um, it, it spoke to my limbic system. Right. And yeah. I, I want to just kind of go back to when you were 12. And I want to know a little bit more about that story, about your, your why, because it's so powerful, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I will preface it with saying it doesn't have to be that way. I think I'm lucky that I have that neat story to to pinpoint back to. But likewise, you know, plenty of people as well um, kind of discover it later in life or get into it in other ways. But yeah, for me, I loved sport, but was never particularly great at it, but also did have quite an academic gifted mind. Um, and so, you know, my family and I were keen to kind of put that to good use and pursue science or something perhaps a bit more traditional. And then, of course, when I saw uh, sports science, and I saw people in lab coats um, helping athletes. Uh, for me, I thought that is exactly what I want to do. That's a way of using my brain in sport. Um, and so, yeah, I had a, the university prospectus at, 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 from that point onwards at 12 years old. So very single minded, <laughs> even at that age. Yeah, it's so, but it's so cool how it can start so young in us. Um, you kind of skipped over your academic stuff. Did you did you just go uh, bachelor's, master's, PhD in the UK, and then and then so you got bachelor's, an yeah, bachelor's at Loughborough, which from that you uh, know seeing it on TV, um, yeah, yeah. I actually um, was fortunate that I um, got an internship at Chelsea. Now, 
I will share the story of my failure though, because I I went for it the year prior to get being offered it and didn't get it and was absolutely devastated. Um because that was also my family's team. I grew up being a Chelsea fan. And so that was my dream job that I thought was in my grasp. And um, I went for interview, but I didn't get it. And um, again, you know, we don't often hear those stories of failure or, you know, lacking success or rejection, but that's kind of a big point in my career. And actually it was a whole year later when I then graduated, when they, they came back to me and said, we remember you from last year. We'd like you to do the internship this year. So, you know, never, you never know even where your rejections might lead you um, mm -hmm. in your career. But then from doing that internship, um, because I'd graduated and got my degree, which I wouldn't have if, if I'd have done it in, in the placement year, meant I was, I was then offered a full-time role and obviously wasn't going to turn that down. So I had, was in industry without a master's. Um, um, and so later on, we started seeing these programs of part-time distance learning in situ masters. And so I did my masters with ACU, Australian Catholic University, whilst in industry um, over a number of years. Um, so that that's how I added that piece to my uh, kind of CV without having to give up the, the job in industry, which we know that it can be um, few and far between at times. Mm -hmm. So what may, when you take yourself back to that feeling of failure, what, if you reflect on that, what got you going again um, in terms of picking yourself back up and you, know, you, you went down some other road to still make yourself better, to give yourself a chance to, to get, a, get an opportunity again, I guess. Yeah, I, I do remember taking that phone call like in a train station or a tube station or something like that. And I, there was definitely tears, I'll be honest. Um, Hard to remember, you know, exactly, but certainly now I look back and, and I'm, well, I'm grateful for how it panned out, not just because I did then get the opportunity at a better time, but actually that it, one of the sacrifices I would have made had I got that opportunity earlier was uh, then not living with and graduating with my friends because it wasn't the standard to have um, a placement year. So obviously it would have been an invaluable experience, but also all my friendship group and everyone else course mates would have continued graduated together and actually that final year of my degree was by far my most enjoyable and I have some of my best memories and still very close to my friendship group then um and yeah had graduated I think I'd booked to go off traveling and then was going to maybe go back to Loughborough and do a master's um and didn't hadn't, didn't even have Chelsea or that internship program in my mind so when the message came out of the blue um, from uh, from them, it, uh, I think I probably nearly fell off my seat. <laughs> um, so, you know, and I, I've had that. I'm sure maybe you've had that as well, where opportunities or conversations or people you've met along the way from the past crop back up again. And I think, I don't know if we'll get into it, but this is such a people industry. It's so relationship-based that you never know when that person that you meet at a conference or that you interact with over social media um, might crop back up and it might not be a job opportunity, but it might be uh, a writing a paper, paper or it might be a conversation, anything. And I think um, it's pretty cool when you look back and see how interlinked your career um, and our networks can be. Oh, it's, it's crazy. I mean, it has to happen to me just about every week um i meet someone that you know kind of see see what they're doing and uh yeah it's you know and give them props and whatnot and they they are equally impressed with what i'm doing and then of, of course we we talk about all the people that we both know and then we you know but we just haven't so again it just it um it really emphasizes the point you just made in that it is such a small little world that we're in mm -hmm. Right. And um, and yeah, so it's and you never know what an op you know, what opportunity is right around that corner. So, um, yeah, it's uh, I guess our reputation and that people stuff is just so is so uh, critical to to what 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 we what we try to do. Um, yeah. Absolutely. So that's super cool, Joe. Um, maybe we'll kick things off as we always do on the training science podcast with our probably our key question. We are the training science podcast. So we like to know a little bit about people's philosophy on, on training and 
we like to know, you know, you know, when you start with an athlete or team, say you're going back to the Bills or the Buffalo Sabres or, uh, or Chelsea, it's like, where do you sort of start with your whole process uh, or philosophy on what you, on how are you going to prepare that team or an individual for a key event? And obviously there's a lot of context and, you know, wide openness there with, with that question. But as an overarching philosophy, you seem quite poised with your experience to be able to um, give us some, a good framework for that. Any thoughts? Yeah, so I am an applied sports scientist. I uh, and my experiences have predominantly come in a team sports setting. So although I studied physiology more so at university, I, I in, in my roles in team sports and even now consulting to number of teams, I see myself kind of as that generalist who can support the decision makers and the key stakeholders. Um, I use research and data and where suitable technology to try to support those key stakeholders with making objective decisions. So a strength coach or strength and conditioning fitness individual has questions around um, how best to individualize a program or in terms of training load, how their load in their setting might complement the on-field work. And I can use my, the screening data of athletes to try and make some suggestions there. Um, I, am, I am collecting objective information from the playing field that I can filter through to them it, to translate into their context. And that word translate, that's probably a key part of my philosophy, actually, on reflection, because I, I'm sure it would be one of the most frequent words written on my blog at you know, because uh, I talk a lot about that we need to translate whether it's research to practice, whether it's data to action, or whether it's translating the information I'm collecting to a head coach or to an athletic trainer or medical professional or or to the general manager or CEO or owner of a, of a team. Um, how I translate that information is very intentional um, and I try to adapt my approach depending on the situation and the individual that I'm trying to support. What do you what do you really focus on when you're in the process of translating? What are the what are the must must do's of the whole process for you? It's the question that that individual or the problem that they're trying to solve. Because I have endless information that I can just bombard people with. But the question I come back to is the so what? So what are they going to do with it? So what does it mean for that individual? Because they're all busy and they've got limited headspace. So what does this mean for them? And then it's also knowing how that inf individual best consumes information. Mm. So I have to incorporate that into my translation process. I've worked with coaches who want to see everything, who want to see the charts and the reports. And I've worked with coaches who say, I trust your information. I actually don't want to see any evidence. Just tell me what you want me to do or what I need to do. And actually, as frustrating as it might be as a sports scientist to have your pretty reports and graphs that you want to share, that's kind of the ultimate compliment because that coach is saying, I trust you. Just tell me what I need to know or what you, you know, what the key thing is. Um, so I think the so what coupled with how they consume that information, is it paper? Is it verbal? Is it 10 charts? Is it zero charts? I think those two things are definitely key. Yeah, that's a pretty awesome segue, Joe, for the blog you wrote. You know, I was kind of leading you towards that. And uh, in, a, in a way, your translation philosophy resonated with a lot, of, um, a lot of points that you make in there. Because to translate well, you need to understand the situation. You need to understand the context. You are curious about the type of uh, individual you want to translate into. Uh, and then, of course, communication was the other key thing that, um, that was in the, 
you know, your, your philosophy that you wrote for us on hit science that we'll link to in the show notes. But um, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's nice how, it's nice how you kind of frame that into a different, um, a different way of sort of saying it, but I guess translation really, it, it, it sums up everything else that you, that you wrote for us. So super cool. Yeah, I think it is. Well, I went back and had a look at that because I wrote that back. That was back in 2019 that that was yeah. published. So, yeah. I mean, not much has happened in the world since 2019, right? So um, <laughs> it, I, I, yeah, it was very interesting to go back. And at that point, I was still in the midst of working in the bills. Um, and I, you know, it was only one or two years into working in the NFL, but I was in, in deep with this being in new sports and trying to find my way to make a difference as a um, foreigner, as an outsider to the sport, as a, as a female and all those factors. Um, and yeah, I guess the context, curiosity, communication, all still key, but maybe the, the so what piece um, and that translation central piece is probably how it's developed in the last few years since then. Yeah. That's super neat. Well, next question, um, our topic that I wanted to speak on was, again, um, a, a really cool blog post or LinkedIn post that you wrote. And it was, it really got me thinking. It's along the lines of gender diversity and uh, the gender diversity issue that we see in sport. I mean, really, it's still all across. Um, it's not just in sport, right? It's in business. It's in so many other things. Um, and, you know, again, Martin and I are as guilty as anyone else where you are the third, um, third woman that we've had on the podcast, um, you know, it, coming in here in episode around episode 60, I believe we're on. Um, so why is that? Why, uh, you know, it's, it, it certainly has not been purposeful or anything from Martin and I. So I want to understand sort of what, what, what's the, why is it kind of, sitting that way. And I'm even, you know, I started going off on all these different tangents, but it's even in the, when I look at myself as a researcher, we're also like all the studies that I used to do were, they had to be males and your professor would tell you, oh, it's gotta be in males because we can't deal with the menstrual cycle. That's uh, so we, you know, of course the, then the whole research uh, context gets filled with uh, studies that are done in males. So it's, it's just everywhere, this whole lack of gender diversity. And you're arguing that um, it, guys, everyone if you know we're missing something if we're not if we're not um doing a better job with balancing the, the diversity out there so i'll uh, i'll leave it to you to 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 move to move forward on that topic though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm not sure i can solve it all here and and look i don't purport to be a an expert in um, edi by any means but obviously can speak sort of from my experiences and the experience of someone actually who's had a, a really um, positive, enjoyable um, career as a female in this male dominated environment. Um, I had not worked with female athletes until the last year or two when I got involved in consultancy. So there's also like you say, there's there's the staffing piece and there's the athlete piece as well. Um, and I. We certainly need to give thought to to both, and and there are there is growing conversation and awareness now, obviously across society, but also in sport. And I read um, there's a couple of really interesting pieces I've been reading in recent times. So there was a editorial in BMJ about um, the need to avoid manals, as in male panels, um, and. And that was from Cherie Becker a few years ago, because we do, it is just natural. It is a, a male dominated industry. I think in part because at grassroots level, you know, we lose uh, females in sport through childhood and teenagers. Um, and so even earlier on in, in degrees, it's male dominated, at least from my experiences. But also there are a lot of females out there and I was I was staggered recently because I just one night put out a tweet a few months back about where, you know, where are all my sport, female sports scientists at, something along those lines. And by I don't know what the definition of viral is, but it was certainly my most engaged message that we ever, you know, like 
hundreds of thousands of views and likes and people commented and male allies promoting all the people they know, which was great. And and now I'm thinking, okay, how do we harness this? Because that community is there. Um, but we need to be intentional. And when we're doing events, hosting conferences and panels, running podcasts, we need to actively seek out people from the minority from both gender but also race other backgrounds as well um and i i read um another article christian thorberg and the danish group in response to becker's um editorial wrote kind of a response about how they were going to address it and he wrote being intentional is different from having good intentions and i thought that was great because i totally agree it's not intentional people when i point out that their conference has all male speakers they think oh we really didn't mean to do that and but yes there's having good intentions which i like to think the majority have but it's the next step of being intentional and, and seeking out i think visibility and then support so we've seen research has shown that female support groups mentoring is really important to make females feel like they have a network that they can reach out to and discuss. But then also the blog I wrote in terms of some practical steps is also thinking about the workplace and making sure there are things like mother's rooms available, which I'd never seen until I got to the US. Uh, and now I think, yeah, that should be a norm. If we want to not lose talented practitioners, it, unless it's by choice, of course, if they go off to have children, to be mothers, but if they want to come back into the industry or continue to contribute, they should have an environment where they're able to do that. Um, and loads of other kind of practical things as well, just around making sure the kit is the right size and, you know, make to make females feel comfortable in the setting. And likewise, it's just as important now women's sport is growing, that there are the same conversations when male practitioners are in that setting um, as well. So. Um, yeah, that's just my take as of now. No, that's excellent. Um, and yeah, I mean, point, point made as well. And both Martin and I need to be intentional <laughs> with, with this issue. So, um, point is made and, uh, I'll, I'll put it here on the podcast. I'm going to be more intentional. So, but I want to know I why. I, okay, yeah. go ahead. Well, I was just going to say like, it's not just a box ticking exercise as well, right? That's what people mm -hmm. like sometimes feel about with diversity, but having a range, having diverse staff, I think particularly in sport um, is a benefit. We know that generally, you know, diverse teams bring different perspectives. They bring more innovation, creativity because of the different backgrounds. But I think as well, like if you take a team sport setting and you have your support staff, you know, some of those players, maybe they grew up with a, a, a host, a load of sisters. And so some of them maybe would really connect with a female member of staff. And that's who they would go to for when, when they need a bit of support. And if you don't have that, then you're limiting your support. And same for different backgrounds, different races. I think it just helps making sure that all the players have someone that they relate to and can go to to have a conversation or when they need support or they need to find the right person. So I actually think it directly helps serve our athletes better as well. Yeah, well, it, we're, we can almost reflect a little bit back, Joe, I'm thinking to um, the piece where you were talking about connections and that we are all sort of connections. We are all connected. Um, to me, it also relates to um, intelligence and you're, you glossed over it a little bit, but I think, I think just emphasize the point that you made in the paper where you're talking about how like there's almost intelligence and um, cog cognition aspects that are kind of going on that are better when you have females mixed into the di diversity um, uh, mix, right? So you're, you're almost, if you have this within a, an organization or a conglomerate or whatever you're doing, you're creating a, a more intellectually stimulating, um, possibly better, machine ultimately right or, or process yeah. whatever you're trying to do what were those ones that you that you're saying that like the, the like this the research and the study support this yeah yeah absolutely I, 
it, group, diverse groups, it helps to avoid groupthink. It helps to avoid, well, we've always done it this way. And again, I, one of the uh, most enjoyable features for me of working in American football was the div diversity of people and, and players. Obviously, think of American football as a sport. I, I think it's probably the team sport with the most diverse demands across positional roles and mo most diverse um, kind of uh, just anatomical makeup, right, of, of player. Um, but also that is reflected in the different backgrounds and the different cultures of these players being from all across America and different different uh, groups, different upbringings. And, um, you know, I was really in a privileged position for some of the experiences I had there where players would get up and tell their story and they would tell their backgrounds and their why, like we were just talking about our whys. And it, it just taught me personally so much about the world and about society and culture seeing the range of backgrounds. Um, and so if we know we've got that diversity in our playing group, okay, maybe not always quite as extreme as that, but take a Premier League team. You have all these different nationalities represented, different um, upbringings for sure. We, need, we can't have everyone on the support staff looking the same, being from the same demographic, because otherwise who do these different um, backgrounds turn to? And then when you're in a room together as a staff trying to problem solve, what are the different experiences that staff are pulling on to try and come up with solutions? Um, and that's really where some of the research has highlighted that diverse groups can, can help solve problems in, in more unique ways. Mm -hmm. I, I can't stop just kind of almost reflecting on, again, our, the, the next kind of pet area that we're, we'll probably dive into, and that's, you know, artificial intelligence. But when I'm going through that area of artificial intelligence and lo and looking at how it kind of functions from the, you know, the deep, deep, uh, deep learning and neural networks. It's really almost, well, to me, I'm seeing sort of a parallel with when you're getting, when you're getting um, diversity within your groups, you're creating, um, a, I guess, a deeper node intelligence uh, mm -hmm. sort of cognition going on. I would, I would almost imagine at some, at some sort of level that that, that could be happening. Um, yeah, some, I'm sure <laughs> I'll just sort of throw that out there. Some, I'm sure some people are rolling their eyes, but that's, that's fine. Um, maybe, maybe that is, we will segue anyways into that, into the, um, I don't know, is there anything, anything further you want to add in the, in the diversity aspect, Joe, or, um, we'll definitely link to the. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I think that covers it and we can link to some resources. I, I think the, I, I guess this the last thing to say is don't ever be worried about asking the question like, um, in terms of if, if you're, you know, a, a male that's setting up a conference, you're not sure who to ask. There are lots of groups now in terms of like, uh, uh, I, I, I mentioned some in the blog post, but like fearless women and women in sport, women in football, or, yeah. or reach out to individual practitioners like myself. And it's okay if you don't have particularly people in mind, um, yeah. but there are people who can help connect you. And that is part of, helping with visibility so yep. you know and, and likewise don't worry about asking a female uh about if there's anything more that they need in their environment as well you know it's better to ask the question in the appropriate way than just kind of be worrying about asking the question in the first place yeah no, it's a, I mean, it's a really good point. And I mean, you, you can't like think of Martin and I's context, right? We're starting out, starting out a podcast. We have no idea what we're doing, right? But, and who are we going to draw on? We're going to draw on our mates, right? And the, and the first 50 episodes, mostly our, mostly our male mates. Um, but you're right. Now we need to be more intentional. And so I'm going to keep you on after we're done here. And we're going to, uh, yeah, I'm going to pick your brain for um, some uh, the people that I need to interview next. Great. Great. And um, that, that tweet I mentioned, maybe we can link. I, I I sort of posted it on my blog as well, so that I can always refer back to it. And that has a ton of people listed underneath there. So maybe we'll link Perfect. to that as well. That sounds great. That sounds great. Okay. Um, and again, before we before we move on, we are trying to do things as well um, within the research setting. Um, so 
many will know that we're running um, a pretty cool female athlete study on Athletica. And um, just, uh, yeah, I think, you know, the, the general gist or the, the question that we're, we're trying to get answers to is, should a woman uh, train um, differently in accordance with the cycle? And that's just mm. and um, and some, you know, again, when you were actually asking females, some think absolutely. And then um, I, again, some think some think no. So maybe there's an individual sort of aspect there, but it's a collaborative study between um, Athletica, between uh, MiraCare uh, Fertility Tracker. So basically it's it's daily morning urine urine samples uh, where we're getting markers of of hormones through the mirror care and then uh also heart rate variability through um hrv for training so pretty neat little little study um very novel totally field-based uh we are still taking up anyone listening we are still taking up um uh, participants so um please come on board and join join in on the fun and that is a perfect segue for our next topic we will move into uh the the world of artificial intelligence that um yeah. Yeah, again, I'm a huge fan of Global Performance Insights and, uh, you know, big, big follower of, I think I've read just about every single one of your, your blogs by now, uh, partially in preparation for this one, but just out of, out of general interest too. So congratulations to all your work on, on that and for being a leader in, in this area. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe just tell us about what you're, uh, what you're doing in, in that space to, to kick things off, Joe. So, I mean, obviously it's a, uh massively topical area that across again across society as well as our cross-section in sports science um it's certainly an emerging technology that's not disappearing anytime soon and so i think it's important that we try to learn about it and upskill ourselves and then try to work out if and how we can enhance it um and so over the last year, I've I've partnered up with Zone Seven, who are um, AI driven company performing um, analysis in relation to uh, training load management and injury risk forecasting. Um, and they they approached me and said, "We know kind of that there's questions. There's maybe people have concerns. So we want you to almost be an investigator for us." And we want you to gather through Global Performance Insights and the community, gather practitioner questions or comments, and then let's try and work through a series where we can dive into that. And obviously, for me, that was really exciting because it was an area that I wanted to upskill on um, and learn about. And so what a, a fantastic opportunity for me to take everyone else's questions and then try and, you know, learn myself and hopefully produce information back to the community that is um, both educational but also applicable um, and you know we've mentioned kind of the blog a few times it's something I've done almost for nearly 10 years now actually um, and actually stemmed from um, it was uh, created by myself and a couple of others initially back in the day as a memory to Nick Broad, who I, I think you were familiar with and obviously through Gareth as well. So Nick was my boss at Chelsea, the one who did give me my first break with um, the internship. And unfortunately, we lost him in a car accident a number of years ago, 2013, so 10 years ago now. Um, and so after that, a year or so after that, um, Johnny Bloomfield, David Penny approached Kind of we got together and said let's just start writing to see if we can keep his legacy alive of discussion and uh disseminating information and exploring research and it's kind of incredible i know i've gone off on a bit of a tangent here but actually that blog you know a bit of writing in my spare time and trying to develop my own writing skills and my own clarity of thought um and research um has kind of just snowballed over the years um and again back to the original question really of like zone seven identifying that blog which is now global performance insights being a platform that they could potentially partner with to address some of the questions um so i threw it out there to anyone who might listen and said what are your questions and had some conversations and compiled and from that, we identified six themes, 
kind of around definition. So what even is AI? Um, inputs, thinking about big data, quantity, quality, context, context we've already mentioned here a few times. So how do we incorporate that? Transparency. And obviously when people think of AI, naturally a lot of people think of black boxes and that's a hot topic. So there was questions around that. And then outputs in terms of data visualization and the translation of models into meaningful numbers. Um, and then the, the application and the integration into applied practice. So that was kind of the whole journey, if you like, across the, the data pipeline. And for each thing we, we uh, created an article, some ways with definition, it was an AI dictionary, which is been really popular because it's just an online resource that you can go back to and refer back to. So some of the others being more myself exploring that theme and how AI might be integrated into it. Some of them, Zone 7 address more themselves, like the transparency piece was a Q&A with them asking about that. Um, and then we brought it all together into a, a report that's free and available to download and added um, a checklist that do's and don'ts that kind of summarise the whole series. And um, yeah, hopefully some people have read it and, and yeah. hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, as I said, it's all available free and I'm appreciative of Zone 7 and their ability to want to, you know, engage with sports science industry and put all this work into like trying to answer the questions and drive forward the discussion in this area. Yeah, it's awesome. So I downloaded it last night. I read it last night. It's excellent. Uh, and I will include the link in the show notes for this. So yeah, highly recommend it. If you're in this area and you're listening in, uh, yeah, you, this is, uh, you know, this is the Bible of, of the area right now. Um, for us, at least a Coles Notes version of it. So, yeah, well done to you and, the, you and the team at Zone 7 for that. It's, it's excellent. Maybe just, um, yeah, I mean, start off with uh, defining artificial intelligence for us. What are we, what are we talking about here? Um, really simply, Joe. I think artificial intelligence is, is a broad term that any time is describing a computer that is trying to be trained almost to think like a human. Mm -hmm. and within that, that's when you start to break it down into the specifics of, well, machine learning does it in this way. And then within that, deep learning does it in that way. But mm -hmm. it's that and that and I, I still hold my hands up and say, look, I'm not a data scientist. I'm still very much an applied sports scientist. But mm -hmm. I think it is our responsibility to try to understand all this area because it's already in our, our realm and it, yeah. it, it it's going to become more and more in many different ways not just on the, the injury risk and training load perspective. So that's my understanding of it as a, as a broad term. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's nice. And I, I'm, I'm exactly the same way. Like um, I'm, no, um, I'm a coach and a sports scientist, and I'm, I'm not a data scientist, but I'm using this, uh, this stuff with Athletica. So, yeah, need to, need to understand it a little bit or, mm. um, in a simple way. So what's around input? What, what are the considerations there that, um, that are important for us in this area? Yeah, so input was around data quality and quantity. And I think data quantity, we, 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 we ride a wave as I described it, because there's some ways we have tons of data and there's other ways that we have much less data. We have a lot, generally speaking now, often in many professional team sport competition settings, we get a lot of tracking data from games, for instance. Um, whenever you do a force play test with that one test, you get a ton of data, but there are tons of gaps as well, when both in terms of when the athletes are away from the facility, there are also gaps in what we're actually capturing, our understanding of the psycho-emotional stresses is much more limited than our ability to actually capture meters covered, for instance. So there's that aspect, but then there's also quality. So how good is the data that we're collecting? And I think this is true regardless of whether it's AI or whatever type of analysis you're doing, that as a sports scientist, we are data stewards. We, we have a responsibility to try and collect that data in a clean and tidy manner. Um, otherwise it's not usable 
again, regardless of whatever analysis is being done. So making sure we're also understanding the quality of, of the data and the processes we use to collect it um, and how that influences it. So are you doing a standardized warm up prior to a jump test? Are you logging um, kind of the OK, you might not you might want to do it on the same day within the periodization cycle. You might not be able to. But in that case, are you logging what day it was? Um, and that that that's probably now starting to blend into the context piece, right? Of are you tracking exactly. Exactly. everything else around it? The the competition schedule, the the players, the position, their injury history, the periodization, the travel demands, all these contextual factors that massively influence um, training load and recovery. It's important to to capture that. Yeah, but you're also and I mean, if your head as a listener isn't spinning, um, I'm uh, kudos to you because mine is right. When I'm you're listing off all the contextual factors, all the considerations. Um, I, you know, as as a coach or even a, a sports scientist with the tools that we're using, it's really hard to to get insight into all of that. And this is kind of where machines could potentially mm. and are, are I believe potentially helping us. Um, because they are able to, you know, if, if they're set up right by us humans, um, yeah. we can put filters and, and whatnot in place. And then the deep learning and whatnot, with the, when you're, if you're training a model, it can, it can do wonders and, and discover things that you might not have even sort of seen, right? So, yeah. yeah. The, the, that's the thing is all, all of this is hopefully going to allow us to harness the power of the machine to better interrogate the data we're collecting. Yeah. But that doesn't um, let us off from the responsibility of capturing the data with good quality in a consistent manner and also capturing the context of what's going on. And that, for me, is why the machine will never fully replace the human. Certainly in our, our, our world, there are too many other things that you see as a practitioner day to day, what's going on in terms of the context, in terms of knowing the athlete and knowing what it means to them in relation to their injury history, in relation to their um, physical capacities and, the, and their ability to, to uh, you know, cope with training loads, um, their family set up, their, their backgrounds in terms of life stresses. Um, I just see it as potential for a more advanced processing tool that I can then couple with the gut and the my eyes and what I'm seeing, what I know in the environment. Yeah, it's a tool, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a more it's a more advanced tool in your toolbox potentially. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where where do I segue? I mean, the other thought I was having, I I was going back towards my field, right? And one of the in in the endurance world. One of the things so sometimes we use the wrist based uh, heart rate sensors, for example, mm -hmm. uh, if someone's not wearing a chest strap and they're notoriously bad for giving a good input signal on the heart rate for the internal load. Um, so that, yeah, again, just a, a really simple example of of how that needs to be recognized. The context of that data input needs to be recognized, uh, filtered if possible. Um, but but yeah. Um, these kind, these types of things, right? There's, there's a lot of things. A GPS trace can be off. Um, a power meter um, cannot be calibrated, for example, or goes out of whack, and the, you know, the, the cadence goes, goes wacky, and you all of a sudden get different, you know, power numbers that are, that are off the chart. And yeah, um, like you said, it's, it's, it's important for humans to still be aware of the limitations and to be able to catch glitch, glitches that maybe, maybe the machine isn't there yet, yet they're taking. Although as we advance, maybe a little bit more, maybe maybe machines will catch up there. Um, yeah, they're certainly catching up in some areas. Yeah, we still have those responsibilities, definitely, to to filter and check through everything. Yeah. Um, well, one area that in my field is just that we're looking at right now is unbelievable, and that's Chat GPT four. So. Um, just in turn, like, so, you, you know, you, you said something, you said that um, human, you know, humans just won't be replaced uh, for certain aspects. And yeah, I kind of, I kind of agree with you, but at the same time, 
like what we're discovering chat GPT um, can do is on like from a training plan, you can ask chat GPT to build you a training plan now, and it will do a better job, mark my words, than most off the shelf training plans. Um, in terms of just a plan, and it's, you know, that, that you would pay for on the internet in the endurance world. You can, folks, you can just, just check it out yourself. Go to download the chat GPT on OpenAI, and um, you can go see that the, the training plans are there, and they're, they're built up, and they're better than most that I've, I've seen on the internet. So that's, there's, there's some crazy stuff that's moving quickly, Joe. And, and again, I'm reflecting on your excellent YouTube Ex explanation of chat GPT and, and demonstration demonstration of what it can do. You, the example you gave was, was training, training load, which was, it was, it was excellent. So what do you, what, do you, what else are you seeing? There? Well, it's one, it's moving so rapidly, right? So I think that was kind of January time and now just, you know, I think maybe yesterday it was, or this, this week, Google is now releasing their version, their competition. Um, Chat GPT was, it was GPT three and already since that video, it's gone up to four. So um, these tools are evolving rapidly. Um, and it's important, I think, to, to try to understand the pros and cons or, or the ways it can help and the ways it can't help. So um, yeah, the training program one is, a, is an interesting one. It's interesting that you speak so highly of what it's putting together i perhaps wouldn't have expected such a glowing um you know mark for them based on based on what they're doing because it's a language model right so it's just had tons of language conversation text thrown into it when i did that video and i think still up to now it's only up to 2021 20, perhaps so sometimes with the research if you're doing a very um up-to-date research topic it won't have the last few years in it um but it's just pulling to it's not it's not necessarily searching uh like like google would but it's searching within the, the the language that's built into it to pull things together to try and work out what goes together best so one of the key limitations i found thus far is with references so it is actually trying to pull together uh, from the language, what it thinks would be the citation. It's not actually looking through PubMed or, or, or a database and finding the whole citation. And so sometimes it might get lucky and get it right. Sometimes it makes it up completely. Well, it's always making it up, but sometimes it will give you a reference or a citation that does not exist because it's trying to pull together the language. Um, so that's been like a key lesson for me. And so already now, some ways I've pulled back a little bit from my experiences of using it. So now when I'm writing, I'm still going, I'm, I'm, I'm PubMed, I'm Google Scholar, I'm, you know, I'm all those tools still because I've established its, its pros and cons. Um, but other ways it definitely can help and it's going to keep evolving. So let's try and stay on top of how is it going to enhance what I do and how is it limited? Mm -hmm. Well, this was the, I to totally agree with what you're saying there, but it's the, the evolution of the uh, chat GPT is, is, is incredible to us. So we did an experiment where we, we asked it to build a training plan and then we 24 hours, 24 hours later, we asked it to do the same training plan to build it and it changed and it was better 24 hours later. <laughs> so I just know, crazy. Was it, was it, was it better or is that just the chance? Like if you did it for 10 days in a row, mm. I'd be very interested in the variation because if it's just each time trying to pull from its language database, you, you've got like an N of two there where yeah. it has got better, but was that luck? True, true. Well, we could test that though, couldn't we? We could, we could build, yeah. <laughs> we could build our own model. And, and this is the thing now is there will be research done on it, you know, and we've seen, mm -hmm. we've seen the N of one where it can pass some legal, um, 
uh, test, test, you know. Yeah, it, passed, it just passed the bar. It yeah. just passed the bar. But can um, can it do it consistently? Mm -hmm. um, I've seen, again, um, you know, teachers talking about uh, it. they feed in the marking system and they then they feed in like an assignment and the mark it gave the assignment was aligned with what that teacher would have given. But again, that's N equals one. So mm -hmm. actually, if you did it on 10,000, what would be the success rate? Um, yeah. it's, it's so interesting. Um, well, exactly. exactly. We don't know the answers, but holy cow, it's, it's blowing minds right now, right? So um, yeah, in there, I think, um, well, we, again, at Athletica, we're, we're obviously pretty pretty intrigued by it and um you know we're obviously you, you're wondering about it and zone seven would be the same from a, a threat standpoint uh, or a comp you know competition standpoint but what what we have to realize at least at this point in the game is we're talking about a language model so it's just it's language it's it's only information it's not it, you know at, at least at this at this point it's not grabbing gps data and load markers mm -hmm. and the, these types of things Yet, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, but uh, so yeah. I mean, it's uh, we're putting a blog post together, you know, AI versus AI, um, kind of kind of thing. And uh, yeah, it's at this at this point in the game, it can't, uh, it doesn't have the the context around the day to day sort of changes and these sorts of things. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, but it's again that sure that comes back to to working out how to harness it, right? How can it help you? How can it save time what are what are the what are its strengths that perhaps align with human weaknesses that that mm -hmm. can help with but similarly what are its weaknesses that you're still going to need the human to do and yeah like but as i said i've i've probably regressed back a little bit in now in the last few weeks or so you know writing a book chapter right now and um i'm i'm my process now is still um, yeah, PubMed, Google Scholar, um, whereas people's, people's initial thoughts are that I'm just going to ask it to write a book chapter and it does it. But it, of course, it maybe doesn't do it to with the right uh, most up to date information, citation, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, again, mm -hmm. it's it's finding the right combination. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I guess. Um... I like your I like your skepticism and and um, but it's certainly one that's evolving rapidly. Mm. Um, you know, it's this this podcast will probably be released in two weeks, so who knows what's what's. Yeah. Uh, I hope it's I hope it's still re recent enough, Joe. I'm sure um, it will be. <laughs> um, I I think yeah. I guess I wanted to touch on your thoughts. How would if you were speaking to someone that shares your I guess your skepticism. I, I want to read like I want to read out a um, a resistance quote that I I, I came across from um, again a, a colleague in in the area, and um, I was trying to explain to him about this this evolving area. And um, yeah, he says that as a coach, I'm currently extremely skeptical about the uh, all of this AI use and the way that I, as a coach, um, would use it. So to me, the details are hugely important and I simply don't want to trust an AI program to do any of the work that I can effectively do myself. Uh, I'm very open to, to being proven, proven wrong, but for that to have to happen, I'm not going to gamble on one of my athletes. Um, he is going to be open if he starts hearing colleagues that are you know, finding success with this. So what are your what are your thoughts there in, in terms of when we look at early adopters versus mid and and late adopters mm. um, yeah, are you are you seeing similar with the work that, that that you're doing or any any resistance from coaches or sports scientists that you talk to yeah I think that's a, a common um, thought process because they're hopefully they don't mind me saying but my reflection on what you've just read out is the individual is seeing it as all or nothing they're seeing it as it's either the AI writes the program for my athlete or I do, rather than it being one of the tools on your tool belt that helps you. Um, and I'm sure that is, yeah, that is the natural um, flow for many people with any technology, internet, Google, 
you know, like all the big pieces we could go on and on about how skeptics responded, um, which now to us would sound silly, I'm sure, that has become such an important part, ingrained part of our lives. Um, we've described it a couple of times as just, you know, it is a tool. So for me, I would certainly not say, right, do write this program or, you know, just rely purely on the machine to do it. In terms of like um, a system like Zone 7 would have, I would certainly continue my processes, how I analyze the data pre-AI myself and run it initially alongside. So what does my process think? And then, okay, let me cross-reference that with the machine and then delve into perhaps where there's differences. Um, so that's always how I think I would have integrated it myself. Um, and again, it might be that, it, it, again, it's finding those specific use cases where it is valuable. And it might just be that you take a portion of what it's recommended. Um, so it, it is just the same as like, I don't know, using using Google perhaps or any any one of those many tools that all comes together for us to come to our decision. Because if I link back all the way to the beginning where I described like I try and help these key stakeholders with their decision making. Well, when the coach is deciding should should tomorrow be a day off, for example, something like that. It's not just me that's the input. They've got my input, which I try to do based on science, based on data, based on research. But they've probably also got their own bias. They've probably got maybe the head strength coach or fitness individual. They've certainly got an assistant coach. Maybe they've got some players. And so they're listening to all those voices and all those data streams and coming to a decision. And for me, the AI is like just another individual in that mix. Mm -hmm. That's how exactly how we are using it for Athletica coach version. It's like, it's an assistant coach. It's just one more thing you can consider. You're still the coach, but it's another yeah. tool in the toolbox for you. I was reflecting a little bit on the ad adoption phase and you're probably old enough as well to know when GPS first came out in the world, whether it would have been endurance sports or it would have been team sports. Not everyone was adopting that right away, right? But look mm -hmm. at it now. Um, same Absolutely. with the power meter back, power meter in cycling back in the eighties and nineties, slow evolution. And then, you know, training peaks came along and you, you sort of, you, yeah, it was the tool that you used to integrate into the, to understand. And you get, you had eyes on the road when the athlete wasn't around, you actually got to see what, what got done and, and on and on it kind of goes. And I, I really feel that we're in um, that same sort of phase right now where there's going to be a lot of skepticism initially here to, um, with this tool. But, uh, again, that's all it is, but, um, it, and it will run its course. And I think it's going to run it even quicker because everyone's talking about it and they're seeing the results, you know, right, right. It's right in front of their face. If you go and tinker with, with, with chat GP, GPT or whatever you're using. So, um, but uh, yeah, a little bit of healthy skepticism is good. No question. But I think also being open to, to seeing whether there's real value is, is going to be important too. Yeah. And I think one of the things I like about the series we did with zone seven from kind of like the definition piece um, and, it, and it cropped up a, th a few times throughout is like um, equipping practitioners to know the questions to ask of these companies. And to, because there shouldn't be sort of no skepticism whatsoever either, because artificial intelligence is just a very broad stream uh, or side of part of data science. Right. So actually every company, every approach, every model itself is going to be evolving and practitioners um, can really 
upskill themselves in like, okay, let me understand what, for instance, sensitivity and specificity is. And then let me ask and challenge the company what stats they're seeing, what outcomes they're seeing with their models. Maybe ask them to run a prospective report, um, a retrospective report, which is what Zone 7 will do. So you can start to evaluate what they're doing. Because again, it's not just this black and white, all or nothing. Um, and so I, I think we, we've come up with some, some things that can help in the series with practitioners knowing what questions to ask. But yeah, we're constantly going to be asking the questions, you know, even I completely agree with you about the, the similarities with the journey we've been on with GPS technology. And now we've got optical tracking technology. We've got local positioning technology. We've got companies like Hawkeye coming into you know, various team sports with biomechanical assessments. So the amount of data is only going to keep growing. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do we actually get value out of that data that is being collected on our athletes? Exactly, and, and take advantage of it. Um, again, at the end of the day, we're, 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 we're here because we love sport. And if you're into sport, you love performance. And I guess, you know, we, we want to win. And um, it's part of the tools in the toolbox to, that, that all relates to the, this whole thing. Um, I, I mean, it's, yeah, um, it's seg it potentially segues even to that other topic that you've written on as well with the belief effect. Like if we, it, it's, if we still believe that this is the, we're getting the, we're using everything we can to, um, to do the best job we can. We, you know, it should give us confidence and um, to that, that should um, translate to your word into, into the athlete and, um, and, and the performance. So, yeah. yeah. I, I think we've, we've talked a, a lot there about the numbers and about data and about analysis and AI and everything. But actually, let's pause and actually remember that the athletes we're dealing with are humans and therefore not just our belief in the tech, but also their belief in the program, in the coach, in, in what they're being given to do has a massive impact. And I think, yeah, some of the research that's come out on that, um, not just in sport, but some of like Crum and Langer from um, Harvard's work about with um, maids, cleaning maids in hotels, even them just believing, having the mindset of my work is exercise, seem to change their physiology and their health outcomes, even though they made no changes in what they were actually doing. And mm -hmm. there's, they've done other work as well with like um, smoothies and the belief with what you're consuming drives your body's response, not actually what you're consuming. So then if we think about athletes, and the belief in the coach or the program. Um, so let's also not get too caught up in our laptops and our AI systems and our databases and remember the piece around coming back to the top communication and collaboration um, and connecting with the athletes as well. Um, because um, that, as we continue, no doubt, to evolve with technology and data, that, that shouldn't be forgotten. Well, that's what it's all about at the end of the day, right? Like that's, we're, we're not, yeah, we, yeah, we started with um, isn't, you know, the lab coat and being a sports scientist isn't that kind of cool, but we're doing it for the same, you know, we're doing it to enhance the performance uh, yeah. of our athletes, um, to help our coaches, um, to be part of that process. And that's where it all happens, right? So whether, whether we do this sort of stuff or not, that is still going to keep going on. And that, that play and that fun, that's, that's, that's what it's going to be going to be happening but are these tools that can enhance that process and i think there's pretty there's a lot of evidence that um certainly looking that way so um mm -hmm. yeah joe it's been a it's, i'm well over the hour it's been a fantastic conversation is there anything that uh, you know other other points that you wanted to make that i i haven't pulled out of your brilliant mind <laughs> I really enjoyed the conversation. I, uh, it's, it is interesting how some of these different tangents that we maybe brainstormed we could talk about kind of do actually all link together. Um, but no, just to say that, like, 
um, you know, a big part of what I try to do as well is putting, as you guys do at Hit Science, putting education, discussion and pieces out there, whether that's like through my blog or through videos on YouTube or social media. Um, and so it'd be great, yeah, if people could check that out. But also I welcome like any comments, questions, feedback, anything they want to challenge on. Um, I'm always willing to to have a, a conversation and dive into any of these topics, really. Yeah, fantastic. Well, Joe, you're um, you're a real blessing to our um, our industry, and um, yeah, really, uh, Martin and I are grateful for your um, yeah your contribution to the whole field, and um, yeah, I wish you great success with with all the work that you're doing. I'm gonna yeah, we'll continue to follow you and. We'll, um, we'll, we'll include all of the links to all the various different things. This will be a long one. Um, and I'm going to get some uh, info as well from you on um, some important uh, other women that need to be on the, on the show. And, and I'll be intentional Great. on that. Great. Thank you. Excellent. Paul. Thanks, Joe.